Welcome to The Hit Show, especially my loyal listeners in The Hit Squad. Here we talk about mastering hit, honesty, integrity, and transparency, and about investing in relational capital to create influence, and then how we wield that to create opportunities to make more money. We also talk about how this relates to a balanced life enterprise and more discretionary time to do the things that you love to do. My name is Stephen Cohen, and they call me the Hitman. And practically, I'm showing you how to reach a better quality of life. This is why I interview the people that I do, because they have it. And they can show it to you, and you can learn it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let's get started. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Hit Show. We're going to get started today. And it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting show today, I can tell you, because um, as with every Tuesday, I try to get interesting people. But this guy here, I've been chasing him. I don't even know how long. How, how long has it been? I don't know, six yeah. or eight months. Yeah, something like that. Chasing him for a while. Ron Lynch is on the other side of the camera and of the microphone today. Ron is well known for taking GoPro uh, from 600K to 650 million. You're going to ask yourself how we did it, but don't ask yourself yet because he's probably going to answer, right? Hi, <laughs> how you doing, Ron? Good to have you. Good, man. good morning. Good to see you. All right. Where were you calling in from? Yeah. Texas, Depending right? Where are. What's that? Depending upon where you are, good morning or good evening. Actually, it's, it's coming into the evening here in Budapest, um, and you're in Texas, correct? I'm in Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas. All right. So let's just start with the most obvious question. How in the heck did you go from 600K to 650 million? With a great product. With a great, you know, with a great product, there were a lot of sports cameras out at that time. Right. GoPro, um, their first camera was not like super great, but their mounts were ingenious, and they poured a ton of money, investment money, into developing a camera that was really stellar. And uh, the the easiest thing about selling a GoPro or probably anything is that you're selling the audience themselves. Um, that product came around right at the burgeoning of both YouTube and Facebook. Huh. And the, the product provides an opportunity for a consumer to make a great video, a cinematic film of themselves doing any sport. So they don't have to talk about how great they are. They can just show <laughs> that. Did you choose the product or did they choose you? They chose us. I, we found it at um, the uh, Salt Lake City Outdoorsman Show. They had a booth there. And they were primarily selling at that point in uh, surf shops and ski shops. Right. Uh, they were in, they, they did not have wide retail distribution. They had very narrow, very narrow channels and were primarily an internet purchased product. Oh, wow. Okay. So how is it now? And what do you do now that, that you, you had that success? And of course that was, you know, a few years ago and in between you're doing other products and stuff, but are you in the luxury now of choosing products yourself and say, yeah, I'd, like you go after them or do you have the luxury of actually people always coming at your doorstep? Yeah, people people come to us primarily, and I, I I wouldn't say that we we choose so much, but I guess in a way we do. We we select things that we know are quality products, right? Um, because why sell put all yeah. the you know energy and investment into something that isn't really great? Right. So we we represented the last few years Samsung and helped them release a line of robotic vacuum cleaners called PowerBots, which have done extremely well in the marketplace, both direct to consumer through infomercial and television, right. and then retail support through television and online. So we we create campaigns both directions now. One of the things we learned from GoPro is how to take a customer from television and pull them into the internet. Oh and wow. Now we invert that. So we, we start a lot of products online and work out really strategic, long ad maps and, and consumer journeys and experiences for the consumer. And then eventually some of those products go to television. What, what, what about like small companies, startups that don't have the money to invest in you? Do you, do you sometimes invest in companies? Do you sometimes like say, look, this looks like a good idea. We'll take, you know, equity stake or something. We do sometimes, and it's usually a combination of equity and fee for service because you know video is expensive to shoot. Yeah, we do it well, and so we, it's a combination for some things. And we take a lot. We do, I mean, we GoPro was a launch product. It wasn't like they had zillions yeah. of dollars to spend with us. So we do primarily do launches, and we do launches in innovation. Right. So we're always looking for an innovation that that serves the consumer well. Okay, so now I'm going to hit you. What, what is this, this is called the hit show because of honesty, integrity, and transparency. How much does the owner or the representative or whatever it is who you're working with, how much does their, let's say, personality, their honesty, or their integrity play a role in making a decision, even if the product is like the product of all time? Um, you know, I try to focus on the product. I don't 
I don't tend to find, I don't come across a lot of people that have massive character flaws or, or nasty people. Like it just yeah. isn't, it's just not that common at the top. That's usually common at the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah scraping, yeah. scraping out to get along, trying to make deals. Yeah. 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 yeah it's, it, if anybody's trying to get famous or rich, that's usually a, a good indicator that you should steer clear. Clear of them. We're yeah. looking for people that are serving the audience. Okay, well, you're, you're talking about something that's in, in, in uh, my realm. I started about a year and three months ago online for the first time in my life. Like I said, oh, let me do a business page, you know? So um, next thing you know, I'm making $100,000 on consulting, doing what I do offline, but online. And now I've, like, they, they say, oh, you're an influencer, which I don't even know what that means. But anyway, um, so right. people who try to get influencers online or be famous online, there's a lot of disingenuous sort of messages out there, don't you think? I think that there's a lot of um, coaches that teach coaches how to coach coaching to coaches. <laughs> Man, um, you're speaking my language, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love it. Yeah. And that, that's so, it's so strange. And why do people buy it? Why do these coaches teach coaches how to teach coaches coaching? How do they make a million to throw $33 million? Whatever it was the one guy made, I'm not going to mention his name, but. You know, I think that, well, I think that people are, are hungry for success and they start out chasing money. Yeah. And, and if you chase money, it's easy to succumb to someone else who's chasing money because you're aligned with them. You have, right. you have a similar philosophy, whether you realize it or not. So, um, Great point. I, I don't hurt any of those people. They, they, you know, they're, they're typically charging relatively small fees to people who can afford relatively small fees for, uh, <laughs> relatively small results um so i kind of i kind of tend to dig into those folks as far as like i do my research for them i'm very yeah. curious about how people do that so i kind of go in i'm like hmm they haven't really done a lot and um and there's probably eight or nine people that i would say that that operate at a level that have done a lot that have yeah. launched a series of big brands and they have legitimate techniques that are replica replicatable and that's uh, those. That's what you want to look for, I think, if you're looking for uh, right. an online coach like program, influencer, course thing, or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Do you do you market those as well? Do you market courses and things? Um, I I quietly market a course myself. That's it's kind of odd and exclusive. It's called the Marketing Mercenary. Um, <laughs> It, it it starts with with money mindset and how you think about success and money. And most people that go through the program, um, I'd say triple their income within three years um, because of that one key component up front. And then I teach them how to select a product, what are the, what are the rigors of a product, how to, t how to test it, then how to create a proper creative brief, which is a step that most everybody skips. And they get five or six years into the business and then they start at that point um, and then teach them creative. So, it's so that, that's specifically a business for launching a product, any product or service. It could be a product or service or yourself. And some of them are products that exist. Like right. the technique that I use, um, are you familiar with Tucker Max? Sounds familiar. Tucker has a company called Scribe Media. It used to be Book in a Box. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. they specialize in having, um, doing the work for, for executives and uh, folks that want to write their own book right. for their right. industry. And there's a thousand reasons for people that, that want to do that. And I went into Tucker's company last year and helped him do this process of a creative brief. And the result for them was doubling their revenue. And they're on the trajectory to double it again. But it's simply about getting in the right alignment up front and knowing what you're selling to what vertical and how to message to different verticals. And most people don't do that. They're, yeah. they're focused on the features. Here's what my product does and here's yeah. the features. That's no. not why people buy, but people buy for benefits. Benefits. Yeah. And what's the, what, what about the buzzword? My, my, my customer avatar. How's that? For, how's that play um, into it? I think that the risk of having a customer avatar is allows you to be lazy and, and market in one way to one person. Yeah. And if you really analyze your customers, there's usually six or seven uh, yeah. people that are, that are buying your product for six or seven different reasons. And you're saying break them down and, and each of the six or seven communication pieces of communication should be tailored to that. So you have six different types of communication. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You have from the get go, from the get go, like don't start with one and then build out or wow. Right. 
That is, is he, I, I've never heard that. Honestly, God, I never heard that. And I'm, I'm, I'm not a marketing guy, so that's that's not a I'm not a, that, that's not saying much. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you where I learned it. I learned it on a, a product years ago, and this was as the internet was developing in this type of marketing. TV forced us to a place for a long time where you'd say one message to an entire swath of people because there were only so many TV networks and you could right. only afford to make so many TV commercials. We had a product come along called Aero Garden, which was a hydroponic garden that sits on your countertop. And we dug into the research of Aero Garden. We found out there were four distinct people that were buying it for completely different reasons. So there was a man that was buying it that liked to grow tomatoes in the wintertime because tomatoes is kind of a, um, uh, it's a pride of, of gardener. Uh, yeah, chip. you're right. Yeah. And you can't grow them in the, in the winter. But now these guys grow tomatoes. Then there were moms that were growing basil and thyme and uh, herbs and going to Costco and buying a cheese pizza and throwing these herbs on a pizza and saying, I cooked this fresh. <laughs> you know, feeding her kids this. You know, it's kind of an alibi for yeah. out of guilt. Like, so there were four different customers. And we built four specific different creatives and ran them on different TV networks. So we learned that lesson that it, that that worked and it drove online traffic and sales in those specific verticals. Well, that's exactly right. what we did to GoPro. Is uh, okay. we didn't have a GoPro commercial. We had right. twelve, and they all ran on different networks. Different, yeah. Wow, interesting. Wow, that's 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 a big deal. I, it's funny because the first time I heard that was yesterday in a call that I had. The same thing that they had a coffee that they were marketing, and they saturated the one market, and then they said, "Okay, look, we need to move more into this market." So they they literally segmented four other markets. Mm -hmm funny how it how it's like it's like the what is it the ferrari effect you see one ferrari and then you see 10 and before that you never you, you know you never saw any i guess that's the point all right so all of this got you to a place where you were invited into a certain group called baby bathwater right yeah. and as was i right don't ask me how i got in there it was a fluke i guess but uh <laughs> i i showed up there last year in june on an island in croatia and and I was asking around because as people who were as you know the hit squad who's listening right now, you got to realize that when you go to this island, there's 150 entrepreneurs from all over the world, mostly America, but all over the world, uh, high end people that really know their stuff. And there I was, you know, Charlie Brown sitting in the middle there trying to trying to keep his yeah. weight, right? And I know I said, yeah. and I showed up, and you you have three sessions at a time, you have three hour three hour sessions a day, but during each hour you have three to choose from. Uh, you know, I was like, okay, where do I go? And everyone said, you got to go to Ron Lynch, got to go to Ron Lynch, got to go to Ron Lynch. So I went to Ron Lynch and the first thing you did was wealth. Remember that? Yeah. And that stuck with me to this day and it really helped me. So if you're seeing your course does that, but in a more detailed manner where you can actually have like almost a one-on-one, -on -one, I can imagine how that's going to hit home. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, it was, that was, it was pretty, and you were so, you were so like relaxed at it too. It was great. Um, it was my first, I think you were, you were the first one that I went to, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe the second one, first or second one. Yeah. And you, you packed the house or the, the, what do you call it? Veranda or whatever it was called. So um, talk about baby bathwater for a second. Sure. You know, people always talk about networking and nowadays it seems like masterminds are sort of replacing what people used to call networking. I mean, how okay. important, I mean, for me, baby bathwater changed my life. It literally changed my life in so many ways. I can't even, can't even, you know, keep going into detail. But for you, is it something that you do more often? Is Baby Bathwater your only mastermind, or is it is it something you use on a regular basis? I mean, how, how does? I mean, because for me, you don't you, you can't learn that much that I learned in those four days in a whole year. You just can't, right? right. So it'd be you know, so it's much. It's, it's so worth it. So how, how do you see masterminds? Should people get into them? At what level should they get into them? Should should someone who's just starting out try to get in, or how does that work? What do you think? Yeah, well, it's it's like it's a shortcut to university from people who've had practical applications. Right. So th there's a couple kinds that I look at. Um, I, I tend to go to masterminds where I'm allowed to teach. And that was one of my requirements to go to baby bathwater. Although I was a member, I'd been asked to, to talk a, a number of times and people typically talk about their story or their path. And I don't find my story or my path all that interesting. So I'd rather, teach practical applications that anybody can employ in their life, whether it be wealth building or, right. or product collection or whatever. So I, I tend to look for, for places at my age though, I'm in my fifties where people are receptive and I know if they say yes to me teaching that they'll say yes to other people teaching. Uh -huh. So I can go and I can learn from other people. And if they, if it is more of an ego fest where one individual is really, um, 
it's their thing. Um, I, I kind of shy away from that because those are, the, to me, that's again back into the coaches who coach coaches. How to right. Coach. So what should they look for? What should, what should people look for when looking for a mastermind, in your opinion? I think that you should look for an outline and a curriculum and, and go, what are you guys going to do at this mastermind? What am I going to learn? Right. Um, so that there's definitely going to be a takeaway f- and from multiple people, not just one individual at a mastermind. Right. Um, so that there's, there's five or six things that you know that you're going to pull out of it that are going to be useful to you. Because that's the purpose of going. And, and at, at equal, in that environment, you're going to meet people to network with that are worthwhile. Um, in the other networking uh, sense, if you go to an event where there's one person that's dominating it, um, hawking their wares to the next mastermind that's going to be more expensive, you're going to tend to find a bunch of takers in the crowd too. So it's, it, and you don't want to be in a crowd where everybody's taking. You want to be in a nope. crowd like Baby Bathwater where people are, are predisposed to sharing and giving, and that's yep. why they're there is to show their wares, to, to show their, their flaws and their warts, and get help, get true help from other people who've gone, oh, wait, I, I can solve that, or I know a person I can connect you to. I know, it's, I, I couldn't write fast enough. You know, I, I, you know of course, we, we get to the presentation. What I love about Baby Bathwater is, you can't film, you can't film, right? You can't, like, take pictures and stuff of the presentations. And you don't want to. You know, it's like, you don't even want to. You don't want to, like, you don't want to, like ruin the, or, or, you know, just disrespect the process. Because you guys are up there giving you this massive knowledge, and I'm like right and going, geez, I wish I could film this. I'm like, no, actually, I don't want to film this. You know, this is, this is even better. So that was, I really, really love that. But you said something just now. Yeah. Um, you said uh, you don't think your journey is all that exciting. So now, now we got to talk about it. All right, we got to talk about it. <laughs> where are you from? Where'd you come from? <laughs> how'd, you, how'd you get to where you got? Because you don't just show up and make a 600 million, 650 million. So what happened? So um, my core belief is that you got to do the work first. And I didn't always know that. Um, so when I was young and I was in college, I was a grocery checker. And I escaped from college one day to go with my roommate to an audition for a movie. Um, I thought it would be fun. And I ended up um, getting a part in a film that Robert Altman directed. Oh, wow. Who, Altman is, is now passed away, but he made a zillion movies you've heard, have heard of. The original film, MASH, yep. Nashville, Popeye, The Player. Just, you know, he was yeah. making a movie a year his entire career. He, he was a protege of... Um, Alfred Hitchcock. Wow. He, he worked on Alfred Hitchcock's TV show as a director. And so I learned, I, I stayed on as a PA. And so I, I got my three days of actor work and then I stayed on and I, I stayed as a PA for $50 or $75 a day for six weeks and went to dailies every day, learned what every job on set was, and I learned how to make movies. And so subsequently, I was one of three people in Seattle, um, including Matt Scarrett and um, um, Oh, the only one—the only one of us that made it as an actor. The guy, <laughs> the guy who was That's in famous. all the movie movies, Brendan Fraser. Oh, Brendan Fraser. Yeah. Brendan Fraser, and so the movies would roll into Seattle, and we had SAG cards, so we would get these spots in these movies. And I always asked to stay on as a PA, so I ended up working in thirteen different movies and learned that. And I was on set one day with Jeff Bridges, and uh, was standing next to him, and I was like an extra in this movie. And I asked him, I said, "How do you get to be in your shoes?" And he said, "It's really easy." Make sure your dad's Lloyd Bridges. Oh. <laughs> we both laughed and he, he said, right, if you can write, you, you'll have a job in Hollywood. So, so go home and write. So I went back to my grocery checking job and I took his advice and I did the work and I wrote two screenplays. And there was a very nice lady that used to shop in my store and she used to come through my express line and uh, she worked as a local TV anchor in the afternoons on an afternoon show. Her name was Dana Middleton and we're still friends. She, uh, I told her, I said, Hey, I've written two movies. Do you know anybody in Hollywood that could help me? And she goes, well, why'd you ask me? And I'm like, well, you're the only person in television or in entertainment that I really know. And she's like, well, if you really did bring them into the store. So I went down to Kinko's and this was back before computers. You know, I typed these and I made $17 and 50 cent copies, which was a lot of money to me. And, uh, put them in a bag and put them in my check stand. And she came in one day and I handed her the screenplays. I was very excited about it. And she was like, Oh, okay. You really did it. She goes, well, I'm going to give them to my sister. My sister is uh, Kathleen Kennedy. She's Steven Spielberg's partner. And uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> like, yeah. 
Wow. Now, that was in the day, days before the internet, so I didn't really know who Kathleen Kennedy was, but now she's the head of Lucasfilm. But you and knew Steven was, Spielberg. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, and the odd thing was is that Steven Spielberg was also a protege of Alfred Hitchcock. He had worked on Alfred Hitchcock. Oh, show. I had no idea. So there was this thread of how these guys made movies that yeah. was kind of interesting to me. So I, got, I, I won what was called the Chesterfield Award from uh, the Chesterfield Film Company that they, they worked with. And so I continued my grocery job and eventually became a store operator. And I went into stores and did turnarounds in the retail environment. I spent 10 years in the retail environment writing screenplays at night. And one of my friends had a partnership in an ad agency and they were releasing the George Foreman Grill and promoting that. And they were looking for grocery stores to do demonstrations <laughs> and then film them. And I would rent them space in my stores. How random. Right? It's weird. Totally random. And through that, I met George Foreman's agent, Sam Perlmutter, and offered him a script. And he didn't, it was, a, it was a British sex comedy, and he normally, his main gig was releasing John Claude Van Damme films. Oh. He produced of his films. Um, so he, he optioned this script, and my friend said, hey, I heard you sold Sam Perlmutter a script. And I said, yeah. And he goes, do you think you could write an infomercial? I said, Sure. So I, I, my foray into infomercials was writing cooking infomercials for cooking appliances. And uh, so my first major one was called The Ultimate Chopper, which was the precursor to the um, uh, Magic Bullet. Right. And it sold about $88 million in a year or two. And, you know, these things kind of happen, happen sequentially. You don't really know that it's going to be that big right. as you do. Right. And then I did a show for Kevin Harrington called The Flavor Wave Deluxe Oven. And that was on... TV for like 10 years and did over a hundred million bucks. So I just had this string of right. good fortune of hits of doing cooking and I understood cooking. And so that moved from cooking to different types of devices and appliances and, and the things that you kind of go through. And I um, seemed to be adept at, at writing and directing infomercials. And okay. So where did the cooking come in? Where did the cooking come in? Cause you worked in a grocery store. Yeah, we had that we in the in the grocery store, we were taking stores that I'm going to say were, were relatively medium grade stores and trying to upgrade them at, into neighborhoods like um, when the neighborhood would gentrify and more people with more money would move into the neighborhood. We would buy that grocery store and uh. take a store floundering and turn it into a high end store. Well, we had to teach the audience of that store how to eat better food and buy more expensive things. And so we had cooking kiosks where we did demonstrations. Oh so I watched the chef doing the demonstration. And that was the precursor to learning how to put film writing and, and food demonstrations and put those two things together. So I, I, was, I, was, I was a pretty good cook. And so I knew like what recipes yeah. people would right. want to make. What would be a really cool thing that you'd need this device to make? Right. So then... So you had Kevin, you had or Harrington, and I mean, just just exploded. And then you ended up starting your own agency, or how how how'd that go? So I, I actually I moved to uh, Austin and worked with a company in Los Angeles that had an office in Austin, and I was a creative director at a consumer goods company. So I traveled the world, found new products, wrote infomercials, released those infomercials, right. and did that for a number of years. And then I went back to the agency that I'd worked at for a number of years and became a partner in it. And that's when I did the GoPro. So okay. I, I was uh, at okay, right, right. Left, and then I came back, did GoPro, and uh, a number of other things. We worked for Johnson and Johnson and uh, SC Johnson Wax, and we we've started to focus more on, I'm going to say, Fortune 500 and Fortune 1000, uh, what you'd call more traditional launches when right. URL started to become in fashion and you, you could drive people online. Um, and I did that for a number of years and then I broke away from that and sold my interest in the agency and started my own. And so now, you know, we've had our own agency for five or six years and we have a consumer goods company as well, that in an investor fund that we, we find products and that are, you know, probably 300,000 to a million in sales. And some of, we partner with companies sometimes. So we have, we have a lot of interesting things that we've done. It's been fun. Wow. I feel very fortunate. And you, and you stayed humble. You know, it's like, it's, it's, that's one of the things I know is because you, you said at the, I remember you said uh, at the uh, baby bath where you're 51 and I said, I'm 51. So, <laughs> and I look at where I am and I look at where you are. We're in two different spectrums of the world. I, I worked in DRTV, man, without a pain in the ass. Um, it was like the, the hardest thing I ever did practically to, to get it going and, and, and who to work with and who won't take right. the money. And I mean, it's just, it was crazy. And yeah, you were just like the easiest going guy there. So I congratulate you on that. I actually applaud you for that because it doesn't happen all the time, you know. 
Um, oh, but like, the, world, but, the world will make you humble if you're not. Exactly. I was just going to get there. It's usually what happens is once you get to a certain level, it crushes you and then you build back up again. And that's why you stay humble. <laughs> I got yeah, crushed back in 2008. I've been, through, I've been through a number of cycles. So <laughs> no, I, I got crushed in 2003 and 2008. So I think I pretty much, hopefully I learned my lesson. Jesus, you, 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 you never know actually. Right. So mm-hmm. we're winding it down here now. We're winding it down now. And you know, before we go, I always like to talk to the hit squad and say, you know, you guys, um, you know, look at what Ron is telling you. And there's a lot of, let's say, pieces of information there that you can use. There's some general generalizations that are like very important that I, that I pulled away. I also think that if you're out to launch a product, you got to check out this course. It sounds to me like from what I caught from the presentation, um, just that first piece was, was like literally changed my outlook on life period. I mean, I actually implement this wealth um, sort of not yours exactly, but a wealth concept into all of my courses, all my teachings, all my consulting. It's like everyone has to read these two books and has an audio book. It's all about wealth, wealth, you know, wealth consciousness and things like that, abundance and stuff. So yeah, awesome. Um, and so the Hit Squad, this is for you. This one's for you, Ron, especially. I appreciate it uh, that you came on and you had a, you had a you know, chance to share us. Is there anything you want to share with, uh, with the audience before you know, we call it uh, adieu? I have a new book coming out in a few weeks. I have a, my first book. If you want to look at like how, how we kind of dissect and build something is called buy now. And that's available in audiobook and at Amazon and it's cheap. Um, and I'm, I've got a, I've got a new book coming out that I think I'm just going to release on Kindle and it's called, it's a circus out there. And it, it's a business fable. It's an easy read. It's about a kid that joins a circus the, what I did is I didn't want to write an autobiography and say, Hey, I met this famous person and this rich person. And we did this like that. Who wants to read that narcissistic yeah. babble? Right. So I, I wrote a story about that really was based on the three or four industries that I've been in and shoved all together in this nice metaphor. And it, it's got 75 business lessons. So you read this, read the fable. And then at the end of the fable, there's a list of the 75 lessons that coordinate to different. Oh, points. got to get it. Got to get it. Um, so we're going to put that in the show notes, of course, along with any other links that you need. So your course and your your books. Um, awesome stuff, man. I really appreciate you being on, Ron. It's a, it's a true pleasure as always. Um, I'm glad we get to we get to hook up. Um, well, I'm gonna be talk- yeah, I'm going to be talking to you about some uh, some uh, products as well. So, <laughs> okay, everybody, from, it's a hit show, it's a hit squad. Thanks, thanks for tuning in. As always, it's a pleasure. Remember, every Tuesday we come at you with fantastic people. Once again, we were with Ron Lynch today, who laid it all out there for you guys. To know you guys know what to do next, right? Get out there and start creating that quality of life. We'll see you guys next time. Bye bye. <laughs>